In today's video, we are going to have a face-to-face, apples-to-apples comparison between the base model 1299 iMac and the higher tier 1499 iMac. There's a difference of $200, but many other things besides. So today we're going to be talking about livability and about performance and about money. So sit back and buckle up and get subscribed and turn on notifications, of course, because you won't want to miss this one. Okay, so the goal of today's video is quite simple, to find out if this is worth $200 more than this. Pretty easy, right? The debate over this topic started pretty much immediately after the pricing was revealed soon after the April 20th event. People were saying that the base model felt stripped out compared to the mid-tier one, and there are basically four key differences. For the extra $200, you get the full-fat 8-core GPU version of the M1, two additional Type-C non-Thunderbolt ports, Touch ID on the keyboard, and Ethernet on the power adapter. However, it is worth noting that if Ethernet is all you care about, you can add that to the base model for 30 extra dollars. So that's a pretty good idea. If that's all you want, you don't really care about the ports, you don't care about the GPU, you don't care about Touch ID, that's a pretty cost-effective way to do that without having to buy a dongle. Nobody wants a dongle. I'm curious to know what you guys think. Do those four additional features make this iMac worth an extra $200? Or can you live without those things with an extra $200 in your pocket? All things being equal, I would probably take the 200 bucks and just type in my password, but I think to be fair, what we need to do is examine whether or not there are performance differences between these two devices because that could make a pretty key difference in deciding which one is worth it. We've known for a while that this has the 7-core GPU and this is the 8-core GPU, but how different are they really? Well, this confusion ends today as I've set up a comparison between not just these two iMacs, but the Mac Mini and the MacBook Air as well so we can see how the two chips perform in different implementations. And so, now we're going to run through some benchmarks on basically four different versions of the same thing. <laughs> We'll start with Geekbench, the least demanding test on the list, which unsurprisingly reveals that they all score very similarly. In fact, the two iMacs are just 12 points apart. Geekbench Compute reveals a slightly different story, however, with the two M1s with 7-core GPUs falling behind the 8-core GPUs. And once again, the higher tier iMac is practically glued to the Mac Mini. Next up, we'll go for a more demanding test, Cinebench R23. Here, the iMacs should be very similar since they both have the same CPU layout, but in reality, the higher tier iMac noticeably outperforms the base model, even outscoring the Mac Mini. This is a curious result, and it continues to be curious when we move into Blender. In the BMW render, the higher-end iMac finishes the render in 5 minutes and 42 seconds, compared to 6 minutes and 23 seconds on the base model. In the longer classroom test, we see a proportionate difference with the base model taking nearly 2 full minutes longer than the upgraded one. When we try some real-world graphics tests, we see a continuation of the mid-tier model outperforming the base, but this time it makes sense because there's a difference in the GPU. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the mid-tier scores an average of 25 FPS compared to the base's 23, and the Mac Mini beats both of them with 26. Clearly, the 7-core GPU makes a difference, although, to be honest, it's not a very big one. In Final Cut Pro, however, things get very weird. The mid-tier iMac finished a 10-minute, 10 10-bit, 10 4K 60fps render 11 seconds slower than the base model. This is well within a margin of error, but the two machines were basically tied. These results were honestly quite surprising. I was not expecting the base model to lag behind in as many of the tests as it did, considering that the CPU is, theoretically, the same. They're both 
four performance cores and four efficiency cores. In, in theory, the only difference should be the GPU, but in tests like Blender and Cinebench R23, we could see that the differences were more than just one GPU core. So basically, here's what I think is happening here. I think the seven core GPU variant of the M1 chip is a lower binned version, which isn't able to sustain clock speeds as well as the higher binned eight core variant. And so in addition to having one less GPU core on paper, in the real world, you do lose a little bit of CPU performance as well. Although to be clear, the base iMac does perform better than the base MacBook Air, even though they have the same M1 variation because the MacBook Air is a TDP down configuration that's designed to be fanless. Another interesting thing that I noticed in these tests is that Apple is not afraid to let these iMacs get a little bit warm to the touch. Now, in my extended two hours plus of testing with both of these machines, the fans were audible at times, but they are very, very, very quiet. Here's what it sounds like at full tilt. I think Apple is prioritizing sound over coolness with these two iMacs, especially because they don't have to sit in your lap like a MacBook Pro, so it's not super noticeable if it gets a little bit warm to the touch. And to be clear, it's nowhere near as warm as the old Intel iMacs got when Apple basically did the same thing. They let them get really hot before they kicked the fans in to try and keep the operation as silent as possible, but now it actually kind of works, whereas before they were just running at 99C all the time. What does surprise me a little bit is that the same is not true of the Mac Mini. The Mac Mini never gets warm at all. And I think that the reason this is the case is because the Mac Mini basically has the same thermal design as the old one. It has a heatsink on top of the M1 and a fan that blows air through the heatsink. Pretty simple. However, with these iMacs, I don't think that's the case. If you look on Apple's website, you can see that the fans don't appear to be connected to a heat sink and then heat pipe that directly removes heat from the CPU and exhausts it out the bottom of the device. It seems like the fans are similar more to the outgoing MacBook Air where it was sort of near a heat sink and it wasn't directly cooling a heat pipe. We'll have to wait for teardowns to confirm whether or not this is true, but it's a little bit weird. All that being said, the most surprising result of this testing was the Final Cut Pro render. The two iMacs were exactly tied, pretty much, suggesting that the optimization is very similar and the rendering is probably not maxing out the CPU. Remember that everything else about these two devices is standardized. They have the same chassis, the same cooling, as well as the same RAM and the same sized SSD, but they don't have the same M1 chip. So these results are very interesting. And I think it's indicative of the way you should think about the choice between these devices. When the M1 MacBooks came out, there were plenty of comparisons between the M1 MacBook Air and MacBook Pro, and the difference was similar both in terms of performance and pricing. The Air performs worse than the Pro and costs $300 less. Similarly here, the base iMac performs slightly worse than the mid-tier iMac and costs $200 less it's almost a proportional difference in price and performance. So if you're discouraged by the performance difference between these two, you can think back to the way the M1 MacBooks were covered. People said basically, why pay the extra for the MacBook Pro when you can get most of that performance for $300 less? However, unlike the MacBook Air versus Pro debate, there are more noticeable differences between the base and mid-tier iMacs. You get more USB ports, you get Ethernet, you get Touch ID, and you get a little bit more performance for your extra $200. Whereas going from the Air to the Pro, you got a touch bar and a little bit more battery life and a little bit more performance. As a result of this, I would argue that the mid-tier iMac represents a more compelling package given that you get those extra amenities. However, I don't think you have to go for the mid-tier. The debate has seemed to suggest that paying the extra $200 was a no-brainer, but I'm not sure it's a foregone conclusion. Sure, I would like to have those two extra ports, the Ethernet on the power brick, the extra performance, as well as Touch ID on the keyboard. That would all be nice, but I would also like to have $200, and I could do a lot with that savings. 
I could take the base model up to 16 gigabytes of RAM or 512 gigabytes of storage. I could also buy an external Thunderbolt hub and add far more than two USB-C ports. In real world tasks, you're probably not going to notice the difference in performance between these two devices unless you have them side by side. All the M1 chips are very, very similar and you can only really see the differences when you put them on an even playing field and really zoom in. If you're playing Tomb Raider at 23 FPS, are you really gonna be sitting there going, oh man, I wish I was playing it at 25? No, you're probably not gonna play it at all because that's a terrible experience. It's 23 FPS. Maybe if you do Blender for a living, the mid-tier one might be a little bit more noticeable. We saved nearly two minutes on a single render, so that's, that's not insignificant. However, it is worth noting that both of these are running through Rosetta, so they're not exactly optimized for Blender in the first place. Maybe you'd be better off with a used Intel machine. So there's a lot of interesting things to keep in mind from this video. Number one, you do get better CPU performance and better all-round performance out of the mid-tier. It's not just a GPU thing. And you also don't necessarily notice it in all cases, like in Final Cut Pro, where this kept up just fine. So the question at the top of this video was, is the mid-tier iMac worth the extra $200? And I think it is. I think you get a lot of extra features for that $200 and it definitely makes sense. However, I don't think it's a no-brainer. I don't think it's the obvious choice with the base model being completely terrible and you shouldn't even consider it. I think the base model is still perfectly good and Apple has been very meticulous in positioning these two machines so that they could both have valid use cases. So which of these two machines should you buy? Well, honestly, it depends on what you need them for. If you wanna save as much money as possible, you don't have to feel bad about going for the base model. But if you want the convenience of Touch ID, a little bit more performance, also don't feel bad about spending the extra 200 bucks on the mid-tier one. It all depends on what you need in terms of performance, features, and pricing. And I hope that this video has helped you arrive at a conclusion. If you found it useful, make sure to leave a like down below, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as usual, I will see you guys in the next one.